thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for accepting SESTI, Center of Studies, Society and Technology invitation for this interview. To start with, I'd like to ask you to tell us a bit about you and your activities at the Universita de la Hoya. <laughs> Thank you, Vera. Uh, bon dia to everyone. Um, I work at um, in an online university, fully online university in Spain, in the north of Spain, called La Rioja, like the wine. Uh, we've got uh, 30,000 students uh, and 1,000 faculty. We have also branches in uh, directly universities in uh, Mexico, Colombia, Ecuador, in seven countries in Latin America. And our students come from around 80 countries across the world. Every uh, academic degree is in Spanish just a couple of master in english but research everything in research is in english so we research uh, in europe of course with uh, horizon 2020 and erasmus plus but also in other countries like in uh, china or canada just to name a couple i'm really focused on educational technology educational innovation so we work uh, as an online university and research about online education, very much focused on the students, but also on the on the educational side coming from the teachers, methodology, assessment, dropout, attrition, a number of things that actually concern very much the teaching community in a in a university. I think this is a summary of what we do here. Okay, thank thank you very much. Well, let's start our interview with this uh, very interesting question. At least it is for me, right? What is the most important breakthrough in education, in your opinion? <clears throat> so difficult to name one. By the way, I didn't thank you, Vera, for the invitation. Very oh, rude sure. from my <laughs> side. Sorry so much. I put it online there in the chat, but uh, thank you again for the invitation and also to Professor Spina. Um, so the breakthrough um you mean the current one or the one to come both both um i think that um, right now what we are living right now uh is the combination the integration of formal and informal learning i think this this is happening right now because it doesn't matter how the syllabus is constructed mm -hmm. how the textbooks are there and which ones are there the student is free to go and explore. The student is always free to go and explore. But before this crazy time of always connected 24 seven, uh, you have to go to a library, you have to go to, a, to visit a fellow, you have to go to. Now you can be sitting down here in this room and you can be checking websites and libraries all over in the world okay so the point that um, the student is free to complement um, his or her training in an infinite almost infinite way of uh, of uh, of uh, learning methodologies resources outcomes interactions chats uh i think this is a challenge that this is a breakthrough definitely okay so it's at the same time the opportunity and also a huge problem. If you are a teacher, you are no longer the only source of information for your classroom, which is everything is positive there, okay? Mm -hmm. But in a in a sense, of course, the teacher has to flip over a little and be a part of the educational itinerary, of the learning itinerary, and not just the center of knowledge which is very uh, stupid by the way but it has been for a long time this way uh, and now it's, this is not the case because it's high likely that the student knows more than you mm -hmm. and in very specific topics of what you are talking about he provides more experience than yourself okay so the actual the actual additional value of the of the professor of the teacher is being the the the, the director the orchestra conductor so gathers 
and combines and models and make the final script of everything. But he's not the only one writing, okay? And this is happening thanks to the combination of formal and informal learning. You can go to YouTube, to Wikipedia, Merlot, OER uh, University. There are thousands of, of uh, sites there. And you can complement, and the students can complement for you. I think this is the one of the main things that we have to address now. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, you believe that there are more cycles, according to what uh, you wrote in your paper, uh, there are more cycles of innovation besides evaluation, quality, training. Could, do you believe uh, you can uh, have more? Can you, can you tell us a little bit more about these three things and uh, what else uh, you believe uh, are also important? Yeah, sure. I think that the main, the bottom line of the of the text that I sent you the other day is that um, we usually um, design the education, the evaluation cycle, and the innovation cycle, thinking very much of a different discipline and not the actual learning process. So we usually hire the innovation cycle coming from I don't know. For instance, from any type of industry, or mm -hmm. from business, or from stock options, or from defense, or from stochastic models, or from somewhere else always, because these core people uh, in the market are really used to be always innovative when you build or design a car, or a rocket, or a plane. Or this innovation has to be there everywhere and always, okay? In education, it's always like that. You have to be always very innovative and you have to be providing innovation in a number of ways. But the cycle is a little different. Uh, when you build a product, you go from the start of the design to the mm -hmm. final release. So the final user tests that product. And this means a cycle of one week, one month, one year, okay? A number of possibilities there. In education, if we wait that long and if we say, no, no, Let's start since the beginning of the of the of the academic year and we go through the semester and at the end of the semester we check what is happening and we reflect and later come back but the second semester is here and in next year I cannot come back with innovation. We have lost one year. We have spent one year and maybe this is not needed. Of course, some things could last one year, but many things are just small changes. We don't need to actually change every step of the learning process of or of the educational methodology of the educational structure in a community in a university my 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 speech is that we just just, just have to select whatever we want to change modify amend complement improve whatever we extract it we modify and we reinsert it is what we call it the transgenic approach okay mm -hmm. like if it's a sort of a GMO, mm -hmm. so you extract whatever you really actually want need to change, you change it and put it back. You don't need to change everything. everything. And okay. what we usually have in education is that the law has to change. And we wait five years until the law is changed and later is go in a cascade going to high school, secondary, primary. I, I, this is maybe it's logical, maybe it's useful, maybe it's possible, but it's not the only way. And the school teacher and the university teacher need, need some quick of fast reaction time, fast reaction mm -hmm. uh, activity. And this means just selecting specific parts and make the amendments there and not just to the whole picture, which is can, can be also complementary, but not the only one. OK. Mm -hmm. uh, there are many content repositories on the web. How can one be assured of their quality when we talk about uh, open education? It's a couple of weeks ago, we had a chat similar about the repositories. Uh, people are very much worried because there are many things in the market, mm -hmm. but not all of them are of quality. Of course, this is a market. It happens everywhere. No, You can buy a, a, the best car, the cheapest car, and something that is reliable and something that is not. So different products in the market, and you select based on uh, availability, your taste, um, budget, many things. Okay. Even the color. My wife uh, and I bought a car recently, and I was just thinking about the the horses and many things. As he said, as he said I just want an orange car, and she was uh, the her requirement. And it's one requirement really also 
valid because it's something that you have to check every time. So the criteria are diverse, okay, diverse. In repositories, it happens exactly the same. You have many repositories, many, educa many educational uh, resources out there. Some of them are good in some moment for some people, for some purpose. And maybe the same resource is completely useless in a different setting, okay? It depends very much on the context. It depends very much on that, okay? And a couple of weeks ago, we had a, a chat with our colleagues. Um, one of the, my, my colleagues, a professor in uh, Anita Tabaco, a professor in the Politecnico de Milano, mm -hmm. uh, said, the market will actually decide which product is good or is not. If the resource is not good, the normal evolution, the progress will die. And if it's good, it will go up. Okay. I think it's not too drastic, but in fact, it's some, por some, some point of, of truth there. Okay. Because the, the customer, me as a customer, I will not use anything that is not good, even if it's free, because mm -hmm. I don't like it. It was not, uh, it will not serve any purpose at all. It will be one of the criteria to select the natural evolution, the natural progress, life of this resource, okay? Um, in addition to that, on top of that, I think that we, university professors, if we talk about repositories, mm -hmm. we have to run a check through of every single repository that we want to use in our classroom. We cannot be liable, uh, we cannot uh, hold any type of liability for resources that the students uh, want to use outside our recommendations, but we have to be sure that our additional links, additional resources that we suggest, that we provide the students with, all of them have to be top knock of the of the of the quality. Okay, this is our parcel of of responsibility with our students. I think. Uh, sure. Okay. Yeah, I agree with you. Yes. Uh, what would you consider a real radical innovation? Radical. Yeah, a real radical innovation. In education, I guess that is our main topic. Um, mm -hmm. Letting open education in. Really radical. Now open education and open science as an extension is, um, uh, is controversial to say the least. Many people like it, want it, use it. And some people are threatened because I'm the publisher. How will I get money? I'm the professor. How will I get still master the, the content and the modeling of my speech through open? Some people are really reluctant to that. This is controversial, but the use of open content, open methodologies, open data, open research results, mm -hmm. open licensing, many types of open into the regular programs, into university system, the, the primary, secondary, high school, vocational training, company, everything there, it will be something revolutionary because it will give the, the part of the power to model the own education to every single individual. Mm -hmm. Completely mm -hmm. radical. I don't know if we will see through. We are mm -hmm. working for yeah. that. Okay. We'll see. Yeah, we hope so, huh? <laughs> we hope so, really. Yeah. Uh, have you had uh, any experience with MOOCs and spooks? If so, uh, do you consider them uh, effective? Um, is one better than the other or both are used in different contexts? Okay. I um, have to say that I don't like MOOCs very much. I, I hold a chair at uh, the International Council for Open and Distance Education. It's called, the acronym is called ICDE, okay, in Norway. And I hold a chair there uh, in Open Educational Resources. So I'm now speaking against my chair, just to be mm -hmm. simple, okay, to keep it in a, simple, in a simple expression. I don't like MOOCs very much. Why? Because there are not so many in the market. Mm -hmm. There are just a few thousand in the market. And it seems that they came here to really be a revolution and change the paradigm and change the market and change the perspective, and nothing happened. 80% are really focused on programming, coding, 
English, basic English, by the way. 20% are a little more focused on other disciplines. So the actual revolutionary transformation there is, is not happening. Uh, in addition to that, nobody actually knows how to incorporate this into the market. Professional competencies coming from the MOOCs with no quality system, with a very specific assessment inside the MOOC validated by the university uh, out of 20,000 students connected at the same time or enrolled at the same time. It's not that easy. It was meant to be something completely different, and it's mm -hmm. not. So we have not so many. The impact is so-so. We have a dropout over 80, 90 percent. In some cases, 98 percent of people actually don't finish the MOOC. So what is this for? It's like sort of a entertainment. It's like a movie. You go there. If you like it, you stay. You don't like it, you leave, and nothing happens. So I'm coming from Harvard, Oxford, Berkeley. I don't know so many really uh, reput reput reputed. I don't know if this is proper English. Sorry, with a lot of reputation, high reputation uh, places. I think it's like a joke, okay? Mm -hmm. We can do better. Really, we can do better. So MOOCs are a promise, but so far, nothing. And about the spooks or the spocks, we've been doing spocks for 30 years. You have your own course, you put it there, and people follow, and that's it. This is a spoke. So mm -hmm. it's the usual, I don't know, FTP, uh, PDF, PowerPoint, HTML. We, we've been doing this for since 1995 or 1998. So it's nothing new. The point is that now you put a, a different brand there. And again, like the MOOC, it's a branding operation. It's a marketing operation. What is the actual use for the educational community? I don't know. Spokes were already there and MOOCs are failing. So I'm a little skeptical about both. Mm -hmm. And also because the content is not open, right? Well, um, it's um, under registration, so it's free. I, I, there are a number of, uh, of um, subtle states here between free, open, mm -hmm. universal. I was talking with a, a colleague from a, a University of Cairo in Egypt, and he's opening now a course uh, for 40,000 students. Okay? Could be a MOOC. But it's a course just for enrolled students in their university, in his university, University of Cairo. So I cannot follow. They can follow. But it's 40,000. So is this a MOOC? Because it's free. It's for them. But you have to be registered and part of their community. So mm -hmm. the discussion is there. The open, open people that everything has to be open is completely against. But I'm in a more, I think, uh, balanced situation when you have to actually find the right combination between open, close, sustainable, you pay, it's free. You have to, I, we call it the business plan. It's like a business plan. It's exactly the same. You have to buy, find the balance. If everything is open and free, who pays? Someone has to pay, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, in my university, I, I enjoy Wi-Fi here. The Wi-Fi connection, I don't pay it. It's free for me. But the university is paying for that. So it's free, but in fact, it's not. So we have to find this, this balance. So the 40,000 students in Cairo, they are using a open educational resource. Of course, they have to register, but it's free. And once you are, once you are an, a student there, you can use completely in an open way. So it's a, a matter of semantics many times. Mm -hmm, okay? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, you're, you're right. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh... Well, I, I go back to open education now. Um, what is your advice to get more people to open education? Because I see uh, some people being against it, uh, being afraid of copyright uh, issues, etc. So how to get uh, all these people involved? I think that this is multi-layer. Um... We work very much with professors and school teachers because they are the key. If they want to use open resources, the students will accept these open resources. Why are they going to be uh, against using a good resource? It doesn't matter if it's open or it's closed. Okay. So um, the, the professor and the, the, the docent, the professor and the teacher, they are the actual key talking about the classroom and the academic degree and about lecturing. So 
and a couple of um, um, workshops, a couple of talks, a couple of um, textbooks, a couple of interactive uh, um, seminars, all of them are really needed to, uh, to, to push, to help, to foster the idea of openness into mm -hmm. the uh, educational community. But this is one layer. There is a more difficult layer, which means the, the, the publishing companies, yeah. uh, the accreditation systems, that uh, if you, Vera, design and write a MOOC and you go to the Brazilian accreditation agency to be a full professor or an assistant professor or any type of professor, do you think that they will acknowledge and make any type of distinction medal score any type of your open approach to open education i don't know in brazil in europe it never happens so you can be open and share your things but if the accreditation agency doesn't actually acknowledge that effort i'm working for free on mm -hmm. saturdays just for the for the openness sake but i don't get any it's on top of my salary on top of my um, commitment and my usual uh, payroll. So it's a, it's a matter of good willingness. And some people can make it, some people cannot. Family, extra studies, two yeah. jobs. I don't know. It's not that easy, okay? The good willingness is, is good as long as you can uh, take it over. But if uh, in a certain moment, it, it has to end because it's not sustainable, okay? It's not sustainable. And about the publishing companies, it's the same. If I go to a university, and McGraw Hill or Prentice Hall or any of the big ones, okay, <clears throat> uh, are the actual owners of all the printing material or the printing process and open material is not capable of being integrated there, of being combined there. We have the problem that David, David against Goliath, okay, and we have to find this combination between both. So this multi layer goes to the to the level of the of the commitment and the self-driven approach coming from the teachers, starting from myself, but also there are a number of layers coming from uh, departments and cross transversal approaches, accreditation or the publishing companies, in my view. Mm -hmm. So it's quite difficult to establish the the layers um, it, it's more of a, an intention of the person to join it or not right it's not something that can be imposed of course of course this is coming i think that has has to come from inside some people i don't know i write books every time that i write book and i put it there on in a self uh i get some money back as a royalty uh usually it's like a uh, one euro if I sell 100 books, so it's not for the money, but I get something, okay? And I'm the owner of that, okay? I'm the, I'm the owner of that. If I do the same for free, to me, it doesn't matter because my topics are really tangential and I don't get a real money for that. But for some people making royalties, actual money coming for that, you have to find the, the, self, uh, the self feeling coming from you saying that I can, I can sell some, and I can provide something for free so I can live and I can pay the bills. And at the same time, I can contribute for free to the society it has to be coming from you, of course. But at the same time, when you are decided to do something for free and to and to go into the open education and open science, you have to find the right host, the right uh, driver there. And if you don't find it, you are a freelancer, completely freelancer, which is quite OK. Uh, you go to the. In, on a Quixote way, being in Spain, okay, completely uh, alone and isolated, which is really impractical, very dreamer, but uh, like, but very impractical. So you actually need some uh, sort of structure, some layer level that um, that supports this this self feeling for you, okay? Meaning the administration, the university, the accreditation system, the publishing companies has to be an understanding, a contra a dialogue there. And we have to fight in, in all these fronts, the, the sensibilization coming from the teachers and the students and tutors and admin people, but also on the other sides of, on the other stakeholders, just to be a little more technical, the other stakeholders also matter on this. There must be an understanding between all the layers there. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, I think I'm happy with all your answers. Uh, it's going to be a short uh, interview, but uh, I appreciate it very much that you accepted our invitation. I thank you very much again. Uh, we are going to uh, publish in our newsletter and uh, on our site, SESTI site, your interview and your very nice paper about all these informal plus formal education being combined. I thought the first part of the of your article was kind of difficult to read, but the second part was lighter. So it was very nice. <laughs> so thank you very much, Daniel, for your time. And uh, I'll see you. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you so much also for the people that, uh, who can watch this. I'm, uh, I really enjoy uh, and I always like working with, with you and your team. I'm open to any follow up in the future in case you want to catch up for whatever reason. Okay. Thank you so much, Vera. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Have a nice day. You too.